Hello and welcome to C++ Weekly. I'm your host, Jason Turner. I am available for on-site training, code reviews, and contracting. Now, I recently accidentally dropped this Atari Touch Me handheld game that was made in 1978 and I believe has probably been with my family since it was new, probably belonged to my brother or sister, and then somehow ended up in my collection of things that I have been moving around for the last 20 some odd years since then. And when it popped open, I thought, hey, I'm kind of curious what makes this tick. So I peeled back the input device a little bit and saw that there was a single chip in here with the model number PIC1655A-053. And I thought, PIC16, that sounds a bit familiar. And indeed, I have worked with the PIC18 series when I was doing home automation software and embedded systems back in the early 2000s. And it seems that this PIC16 is part of that same family. It was originally developed by General Instruments, as we see here on Wikipedia, and the development began in 1976. And like I said, this device was released in 1978. And I thought it would be interesting to know if it's possible to compile modern C++ for this chip that was made in 1976. So I started doing some research and I found this note from the LLVM dev group on Google from 2011 saying that PIC16 backend had been removed from the LLVM architecture and some reference to April of this year, so April of 2011. I dug through and started doing downloads of the various versions of LLVM and fortunately the LLVM download archive page is rather complete. In fact, we can go all the way back to version 1.0. Unfortunately, it doesn't give us any very clear dates. So I started looking for releases that were in the 2011 April time frame. So after some trial and error, I was able to narrow down the version of LLVM and Clang that still had support for the PIC16 down to LLVM and Clang version 2.8. Now, this is a compiler and code base from 2011, and I didn't know what the possibility was that I could compile it with a modern GCC, but I went ahead and decided to give this a shot. So I downloaded the source code and uncompressed it in my modern Linux environment and went ahead and decided to make it after running configure. And I very quickly got a lot of errors that are related to a line of usage and honestly not something that I wanted to spend a lot of time on. So I went ahead and got an appropriate period version of Linux, which was Ubuntu 12.04, that was the earliest one that's easiest to acquire, and I set up a new virtual machine for that. So this Ubuntu 12.04 was a little bit harder to get set up in my virtual machine, didn't have as easy to use automatic integration with VMware and such, but I got it running without much difficulty. And then I went ahead and checked out LLVM again. So I downloaded LLVM, uncompressed it, and then just like if you were building a version of LLVM today, I downloaded Clang and I uncompressed that in the tools folder. So after I had everything uncompressed in here, I ran configure and didn't have to do a whole lot to it. I just configured and built, and just like, again, a modern version of LLVM and Clang, it is automatically configured to use all of the supported architectures. And if we were to run configure with help, we can see what supported architectures we have, which we can see here, x86, x86-64, Spark, PowerPC, Alpha, ARM, MIPS, PIC16, and this is the one that we are the most interested in. So I did the build and I did the install, and then I went to actually compile my example program with it. And 
well, I have this, just a simple main, return zero. And the problem with this older version of Clang is there is no dash dash target option. So on a modern Clang, you might say target equals arm or target equals pick 16 and compile your project, but we get this error. So I had to do a little bit of Googling around and I learned that what I need to do is just compile it first to LLVM bitcode, which I can do here with the dash emit dash LLVM. And this is set uh, still supported on modern versions of Clang as well. And I want to compile it and output that bitcode and then we can have the bitcode output. And now I need to assemble that into the target assembly that I want, which is our PIC16. And I can do that here with LLC and dash M arc equals PIC16 test.bc and I'm doing dash o to say I want it to output to a different file and then just dash to say output that to the console. So I can build this and I can see that we are moving o, uh, 0 into some return value and returning from our function and in fact we can have at least some support for this 1976 era microcontroller with a fairly modern C++. Now you might have noticed that I did C++ OX and if we were to edit our test file here and let's just say we want to throw in some sort of lambda this would be pointless but perfectly allowed in any modern compiler and we try to compile again here, we're going to get an expected expression error. It doesn't know how to handle lambdas. So that did make me wonder what exact level of C++ support do we have? So cppreference.com has its table of C++ compiler support. Now obviously C++ 2A is not going to be covered here. C++ 17 is right out 14. Now we're down to 11. And we were using Clang 2.8. So this Clang column here, we notice that some of the major features of C++11 start to come in in 2.9. We've got decal type, we've got a line of, we've got extended friend declarations, and zoom a little bit more, uh, local types as template parameters, inline namespaces, trailing return types, null pointer, all this comes in in 2.9. So basically we have to look for the things that just say yes. Yes, they have always been in Clang. So raw string literals are right angle bracket. Now, if you have not been using C++ for very long, you might not be aware that at one time, it would have been illegal in C++ to do this. because of these two right angle brackets being mashed together. You had to always have a space in there. And this was due to uh, parsing ambiguities that were considered to be a problem back before C++11. But in C++11, it was allowed. So seeing all kinds of right angle brackets together in lots of heavily nested templates is a relatively normal thing for us to see now. So this is one of the first things that Clang supported. That our value references existed. And that's pretty much it. I believe auto, yes, auto was also always supported in Clang. So we have a very, very lightweight C++11 support that we can have for this microcontroller from 1976, 1977 again. Now, there is an obvious problem. So this particular chip that is in my Atari Touch Me from 1978 is the PIC 16C55A, and we can still find information and the data sheet on it on Microchip's website. But you'll see here that the program memory type is OTP, it is one-time programmable. This is before 
we had microcontrollers that could be erased and rewritten. But I still find it personally quite fascinating that a microcontroller was used in this handheld device. A programmable thing instead of some sort of custom chip or custom circuitry was used. I did not know that it went back that far. But you can also see that this microcontroller has 24 bytes of RAM but also runs at 10 MIPS, which 10 million instructions per second is actually quite fast for the era, and that's partially because it is a very simple architecture. And, in fact, if we go back to information on the PIC-16 series, we can see that this had a 14-bit wide instructions on an 8-bit CPU, and the instruction set was very straightforward. It had a certain number of bits to specify which register you were operating on and a well-defined set of opcodes. And in fact, someone could probably have very easily memorized the entire instruction set and plausibly even know how to type these in in binary. And it is not actually that unusual, we learn, that this particular microcontroller was used in this handheld device. With a little bit of searching, I was able to find that MAME, of course, can emulate the Atari Touch Me. And I don't know why I should have ever been surprised about this, but there is the hhpic16.cpp file here, and we can even see some people that we know in the list of contributors to this particular file. But here we can see in 19, this listed as 1979, the Atari Touch Me used this device, but there is also electronic basketball, electronic baseball, electronic football, and other various similar like uh, Simon Says kinds of games, which I didn't mention. That is what Atari Touch Me is. In fact, it is a Simon Says kind of game. It beeps out a pattern, and you have to replicate that pattern, and then you can play the game. And I will attempt to get some footage of this game actually running if I can. So then perhaps the question remains, why was support for this device ever dropped from Clang? And we can see an answer here in the LLVM discussion that we mentioned at the beginning of the episode. It says, LLVM is designed for, quote, normal architectures. The further from, approximately, the intersection of x86 and ARM, the more it takes to use LLVM effectively. PIC-16, we learned, is well out there from LLVM's perspective. As one example, LLVM is built to optimize for machines with numerous general-purpose registers. And it is stretched to say that PIC-16 has a single general-purpose register. Now, this is interesting and worth noting here. Numerous general-purpose registers. There are other architectures from the 70s that we will cover at some point in a future episode that do have numerous general purpose registers. The PIC-16 architecture is not one of those. The other architecture that we have talked about a fair bit in C++ Weekly, the 6502 CPU has one general purpose register, and that general purpose register is only 8 bits on a machine that has 16 bits of addressable memory space, and that makes it that much more difficult to work with LLVM or GCC, and why we will likely never see a 6502 backend that is actively maintained for that architecture from either of those compilers. And one final note before we wrap this episode up, it is actually, again, worth noting that the Atari Touch Me was a stand-up arcade game at one point. In 1974, it was considered a game of skill where it would be a Simon Says style game and you would have to repeat it, but then Technology advanced so quickly in the mid-70s that we were able to see a handheld version of this game only a couple of years later, and we see that actually Milton Bradley in 1977 beat Atari to the punch for having a handheld version of the game. So thank you for uh, joining me on this Blast of the Past and this first episode of a on-again, off-again series that I'll be doing. We talk about old architectures, what the advantages and limitations of them might be, whether or not you can get a modern C++ compiler compiling code for them. So be sure to subscribe, check out any of the other links that are at the end of this video, follow me on Twitter, and leave a comment below.